From the book of Job, we have an opportunity to address uh, this issue that I see as God boasting of Job or setting Job up for something that Job has no idea is going on. Whenever I read this text, I'm wondering why did God think it was important, in my mind, to point out to Satan that Job was upright. Did God want Satan to test Job, even though he knew he had already been doing such? Whatever is the case, God sets the stage for Satan to go and tempt Job beyond his widest imagination, in my opinion. Because we want to see whether he will remain upright. But that's, that's going to be a different sermon for a different day because I really want to get to the gospel this morning. Because the Pharisees come and they want to tempt Jesus and they ask him a question. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus said, what did Moses write? He said, you can, a man can write a certificate of dismissal. Jesus does not get into what is responsible for the certificate of dismissal, whether it is from the woman or it's from the man, because as you can see from the text, both of them could do that, except that for the most part, it is the man who is going to divorce his wife. They don't get into why that is the case, but the Pharisees wanted to tempt Jesus to, say, to see whether he was going to go against Moses. And instead of going against Moses, he more or less agreed with Moses, but said that the reason Moses had done that was because of the hardness of the heart of the community. That is why Moses had done that. But from the beginning, God had created us, male and female, and the two shall become one. It is this passage of gospel that we say in the marriage ceremony, what God has joined together, let no one put asunder. The only problem is, we think that every two persons that get married, God has put them together. Some of those marriages, God never took part in it from the get-go, but never mind that. But we say what God has joined together, let no one put asunder. Let no one separate, if you will. But that is not what I really want to emphasize this morning for this time of the sermon. What I really want to address in the context of divorce is the state of South Carolina. Many of you may not know, South Carolina has never fallen out of the top five of the states for the number of women killed by their boyfriend, husband, or significant other. In 2014, 64% of the women in South Carolina who were killed by their boyfriend, husband, or significant other were killed with a handgun. And South Carolina is now in the top 5% of the state of the number of women who are killed by their husbands or boyfriend or significant other. <coughs> a few years ago, many of you may remember, within a week there were three women killed along the Grand Strand by their husband, ex-husband, boyfriend or significant other. Domestic violence continues to be a serious problem for us in the state of South Carolina. And so when denominations or uh, congregations speak about divorce, it is within that context that we have to look at, okay, what would be responsible for a marriage coming unglued, if you will? There are a whole host of issues. But I want to focus this morning not so much on whether it is a financial issue or disagreement or all those things. I want to bring your attention to the issue of domestic violence for us in South Carolina. In the Bible Belt. For the number of women who are killed annually by the ex-husband, significant other, boyfriend or whomever, the case may be. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And I'm sure that 
in various ways you may be hearing about it. But for the last 10 or so years that I have been involved with the South Carolina Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault, instead of all that we've been doing to reduce the number, it is increasing. We continue to be in the top five states in the United States of women, uh, of women who are killed by their husband or, or significant other. So that brings us then to the whole issue of marriage. When I was the chair of the Faith Leaders Advisory Council of the South Carolina Coalition Against Domestic Violence in, in, in Columbia, they used to ask me to do workshop. Uh, when we went out to do workshops, do the workshop on divorce because as the Episcopalian, they didn't want to ask the Catholic to do it or to ask other people, the Baptist, to do it. So they would ask the Episcopalian, Father Merchant, you better will do that. And I said to them, it's, it's not that the Episcopal Church just sanctioned divorce. I mean, the first, when, when, the first option is not to get divorced. But when it comes to domestic violence, it's a whole other ball game. And in this state, where you have denominations who say marriage at all costs, then there is a problem when marriage at all costs is going to be responsible for until death do us part. And the only problem with death do us part is, is the female who is going to be death do us part. It's not the male more often. But I should point out there have been instances where the men have also been killed. But for the most part, it is the female who is killed. The Jewish fable of, of a man going to a rabbi and saying to him, um, I know that your God took a long time to create the universe and all of that. But now that he has created all, what is your God doing now? And the rabbi looked at him and said, he is trying to pair up male and female. And the man looked at him and said, why is that difficult? That's the easiest thing. And the, the rabbi looked at him and said, it might be easy for you. For God, it is the most difficult task he has to pair up male and female. Two persons coming together to form a year is never going to be easy. I'm speaking to the choir here and I know that. Two persons who form a union is never going to be easy. I can attest to that. Many of you sat in this pew when I, start, uh, when I stood at the altar and told you that Eugenia and I had separated. We were separated for two years. We have also had our struggles, and we have it all over the landscape. But when it comes to domestic violence, I'm one of those who will say there has to be an end. Do not tolerate that because the end may be unfortunate for the rest of society. When two persons can get along and they've tried and tried, I'm of the opinion it's better for them to live apart and be friends than to live together and be enemies. And sometimes you know as well as I do, sometimes we have more roommates than we have husband and wife. I'm preaching here to the choir, I said already. We know it won't be easy to form the unit that Jesus is talking about. And there will come an end to that. And so the Pharisees came to Jesus wanting him to give them something else. No, Moses said you can do it because of the heart that of your heart. If two persons can get along, then they should be separated. But no one person has the right to take the life of the other person because he is the male or whatever the case may be. And for us in South Carolina, we continue to deal with that day in and day out. In South Carolina, there is somewhere in our state where a female is killed because she cannot live, she can no longer live with her husband, boyfriend, or significant other, whatever have you. And Jesus says, well, Moses said that. 
I suspect he didn't get into all of that because he knew that they already knew that. He knew that they knew that Moses had allowed them to do that because of the problem they may have had in their society. I wonder Jesus already also dealt with domestic violence. I wonder what that might have been like in his day and age. We can never know. He never spoke directly to that. But in our day and age, in the state of South Carolina, it is a serious, very serious issue for us in the state of South Carolina when it comes to domestic violence. May God help us as we go from day to day as a state to look at how we go about trying to encourage people to live in their relationship. May God help us to help those who think the solution to whatever problems that they be having in their marriage is the end of the life of the other person. May God help us to help others to see that is not the way to go. The relationship can end, whether it is the marriage or it's just uh, living together, whatever the case may be. We have it all over our society. We may as well name it and own up to it. The relationship should end instead of violence being the outcome. Moses allow you to write a certificate of divorce because of the hardness of your heart. And finally, this is the part of the, the gospel that I find interesting. How did we go from talking about divorce, all of a sudden the children are in it? Because Jesus and his disciples are trying to have a conversation. His disciples still want him to explain more to them about uh, divorce and what do the people do? They bring children in the picture. And Jesus is going to shift his attention from talking about divorce to say, suffer the little children to come to me. Let them come. Don't stop them. In some way, you almost want to see it as when divorce happens, sometimes the consequence is here with these little ones. He may not have said that, but sometimes the ones who carry the burden of the separation of parents are the ones that sometimes are invisible. Jesus wants his disciples to know, don't stop them. Let them come. The church, just like the family, is as guilty as any other organization for the way we have dealt with children over the years. When I was growing up in West Africa, children were to be seen and not heard. I don't know how you do that. I mean, but children were to be seen and not heard. How does that work? And we still sometimes want to have that. We want children around, but we want them to be little adults. How, how can they do that? They're children. A four-year-old will be a four-year-old. He will not be a 40-year-old. And so when he's tired sitting for 15, 20 minutes, he's going to say, I want to get up. I want to go to the restroom. I want to do something else. And if you don't do it, he's going to make you do it. And then the rest of the people sitting around you are going to be upset that you have a four-year-old who is not sitting down as a 40-year-old. I don't know how you do that. But Jesus is saying to his disciples, let them come. And what does he do? He takes them up in his arms. May we as a church family follow Jesus' example and take them up in our arms, especially some of those little ones who are just restless. They can never sit still. And lo and behold, they may be the very one standing before you one day as your priests. <laughs> now, lo and behold, they may be the very one standing before you as your priests. Yep, I remember those days. My grandmother used to make me stand in the pews, stand up there. And everybody would see me and know that I've done something. The only reason why he stands on the pew is because he's done something under the pew. You know? <laughs> She should be around today to see me standing up in this way. So I never knew it would be coming, but those things happen. Let the children come. Encourage them. 
to be a part of the community. Teach them, tell them the story so that tomorrow they can sit where you are sitting. Don't stop them, Jesus says to the disciples. Let them come. May we invite them. May we open our doors and invite them. Not all of them that were coming to this church have been to church before. Some of them will come and that will be the first time they'll walk into the doors. If we don't welcome them, they will go somewhere else. And God help us if they go somewhere else because we didn't welcome them. May we welcome them so that they can feel welcome in this place. And if this is not a place that God is going to nurture them and their parents, then they can go somewhere else. But may we welcome them in such a way that they will see the faces of Jesus that we wear daily as his representative. God help us in our proclamation to the world that we'll go forth and open our doors and let those young families who are looking for a place to call home, a church home, come into this place and feel welcome. Amen. Amen.